Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Jim Cobray. Stand with me. I'm going to get down my knees and pray. Let's go before the Lord. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor, how good it is to be in the house of the Lord. Welcome, Holy Spirit. You're already here. We're just acknowledging that. We're just grateful that you're the teacher of the ch church and not a man because we haven't come nor do we ever come to hear from a man or woman, come and hear from an old man or young man, come and hear from a tall man or short man. We haven't come to hear from a white man or brown man or black man. We haven't come to hear from anybody but the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, us heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us. And Lord, we'll give you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. All the churches that are meeting in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet tonight, Lord, we are asking you to bless them as you would bless us. If they're preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, they're our brothers and our sisters, even though they may do it differently and have different emphasis and different ways of doing things than we do, Lord, doesn't make them any less than us. And we ask you to bless them as you would bless us. We'll give you the praise, give you the glory, give you the honor. Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say amen. amen. As you take your seat, get your Bible, if you will, and you might as well turn to Psalms with me. When you find the book of Psalms, we'll jump off from there. And uh, the journey into the prosperous life, which is so important for all of us to see. A lot of times people don't understand this. They think it's something, you know, that maybe just crazy people teach in churches. But God really wants to prosper you. Now, let me make, make a statement. Let me say it again. God really wants, hear me. Are you listening to me? God really wants to prosper you. And a lot of times people don't believe that because they're not prosperous. But stop and think about it for a moment. When God created man, Adam and Eve, in the garden, he didn't put them in a rat hole. He put them where? In a garden. With every need met that you could possibly imagine. Probably the most beautiful place because it hadn't been tainted with sin yet. You could ever dream of God places them in that place. Even after the fall, you find numerous people in the Bible that God prospers. And you'll find even, if you will, if you take a look at this, that when he takes his children out of bondage, the first thing he desires to do is take those children into the promised land. Do you remember what the promised land was filled with? Wasn't filled with decay and loss and bones, rocks and horrible things. It was filled with what? Abundance of fruit and honey and milk. The, they say that the grapes were as big as cantaloupes. It was an abundant place, and God wanted to take his people there, just like you as an earthly parent want to take your children somewhere that they get blessed. God wants to bless you. You'll find the blessings of the Lord all through the Bible with different people from time to time. The blessings that are on David, the blessings that are on Solomon, the blessings that were on Elijah, the blessings that were on the kings, if you will, as they served God, the blessings. Even Jesus, some people have a hard time saying, well, you know, Jesus, real humble, he didn't have anything. Well, can I mis make a statement? I mean, he has, must have had something. He had a treasure. His name was Judas Iscariot. And if you stop and think about that, who has a treasure? You, why would you have a treasure if you were broke? down, busted, and disgusted, didn't have anything. Why would you have a treasure? Have you ever thought about that just for a moment? Have you ever thought about how if he had nothing but junk on, let's say, you know, crappy old gowns, that why would these guys be throwing dice trying to win that? Because the garment that he had on was magnificent, splendor, if you will. It wasn't down. In fact, can I just ask you this question? How do you travel from place to place with a group of people? Have you ever, I mean, some of you have families of two and three and four. You know how much it costs to feed the kids? How'd you like to have 12 grown burly men? 
How much do you think it costs to feed them and go from place to place? Yeah, well, they slept on the ground. Yeah, but they still ate. They still drank. They still had needs. Somehow those needs were met. And one of the things you have to come to a conclusion about is that really God cares about you, loves you, and wants to prosper your hand. In fact, he has a great delight in prospering you. Then the question has to obviously be, and it's a great question, if God wants to prosper me, why doesn't he prosper me? If God cared so much about Adam and Eve and he put them in a good place, why am I in a lousy place? If God cared about David and put him in such a good place where he had so much that he was one of the biggest contributors to building the temple of God, the house of God, then how come I'm broken down and busted out all the time and don't have anything and barely get by, have no favor with anybody? It's a great question. The question doesn't answer itself by saying, well, God, this. It question comes back to the answer is whether or not we're right with the answer. If God wants to bless us, could it be possibly that we're out of sync with God in certain areas of our life? Did you know that when you bless somebody or give them something, if you gave them prosperity and they didn't know how to handle the prosperity, it would ruin their lives? How many times have I used the example to you about people who have won the lottery? And their marriages are ruined and their lives and their children are ruined and they end up broke down, busted, and they end up on drugs. They end up losing everything. In fact, the statistics are that most people who don't know how to handle the blessing, literally the blessing becomes a cursing. So why would God, who loved you so much, died for you on that cross? Even Jesus himself says these words, I have come to give you life and give it more abundantly. My goodness, how we'd have to be crazy and our theology would have to be totally screwed up not to believe that God wants to prosper us. Now here's a question for you. Listen to this. The deal is this, in prosperity, everybody's got a different view of prosperity. You ask one man about what's prosperous, and he is saying, wow, this is prosperous to me. You ask another guy if that would satisfy him, he'd say, man, that's total junk. In other words, you've heard the old statement, one man's junk is another man's treasure. And so it's a very subjective thing as to what it is that's prospering in your life. What's it going to take to prosper your life? It's not just about money, money in the pocket or money in the bank, money in your checking account and even having something called, I know you don't know what this is, a savings account. It's not about having anything like that or retirement program or anything such as that. That's not what prosperity is all about. Prosperity, when God wants to prosper you, it goes way beyond the physical money in the pocket because you can have money in the pocket and never have anything. And how many times have we used the example of people that are rock stars and singers and have all the money in the world and fortune and fame and go kill themselves? Recently that happens over and over and over again. God is trying to say something to the church. It's not about what you have in your pocket. It's about what you have in your heart. And in order for you to get the hand of God to open the doors that you need to have, and don't tell me you don't want them. And don't sit there all pious and look at me and tell me that you don't care about having any prosperity at all. In order for God to open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings upon you, which was his promise to you, you're going to have to have the right heart to understand how this all works. And that's what we're talking about tonight. Because this, if you will, is a tremendous adventure. This is a journey into prosperity for all of us. And if you don't know what to do and what to look for and how to be and how it's going to take, you will never get there. And you'll wonder in your life, how come God prospered some people and didn't prosper me? And that would be a shame. In Psalms 37, or excuse me, in Psalms 35, verse, verse 27, let me just put it up on the overhead for you. It says this, let them shout for joy and be glad. Here's a Psalm of David. And he says, who favor... My righteous cause. In other words, David's down. He's got people chasing. He's got problems. And he says, let the people that favor my righteous cause, well, let them be glad. Let them be full of joy. Let them shout. And let them say continuously. And here's what he says. 
Let the Lord be magnified. Talking about the Lord, notice the capital W in this next word, who, speaking of God, who has pleasure in the prosperity of his saint. God is making a statement that he has pleasure in the prosperity of his saint. And you say, yeah, but that's David. Can I tell you something? God is not a respecter of persons. You know that, and so do I. What he'll do for one, he'll do for someone else. But we've got to be in a place where it's not going to take us and destroy our life. God has pleasure when you prosper. As long as the prosperity that you have keeps you solid in there with God and becomes great inside of you to help bless others, not just yourself. And all of us in here have got to come to a conclusion in our lives, including me, that God, sometimes I, you know, I, I think of myself, I, we, Debbie and I get so broke at times. You know, there was a time not too long ago we, before we started one of our businesses here recently that when I went to the bank, we, we have a number of bank accounts, a number of banks. There's one particular bank I'd go in in Red, Redlands and as I walked in, they'd say, oh, Mr. Cobray, come, never get in the line, always come to the table, we'll take care of you right here. That's when I had money in the bank. You just come and whatever you want, we'll take care of it. You don't have to stand in the line. Now I'm in business. I'm just pouring out money everywhere, not getting any return yet on anything. Can I tell you something? They all look at me and go, in the line. <laughs> and can I just say this for all of us? You know, all of us want to do something and be something. Want to have something. We want to be happy in those areas. Why don't we learn something? Not only learn something about God, that would be great, but let's learn something about ourselves tonight. There are four little areas that I want to share with you about the things of God, things to know about prosperity. You've got to get these four areas down or nothing else works for you. Things to know about prosperity. Number one, you've got to know the source. Now listen to what I'm going to say to you in order for you to be successful. You're going to have to understand this. It's not what you have in the bank that's your source. It's not your retirement program, listen to this, that's your source. It's not your job that's your source. It's not the promotion that you might get or the money you're able to save and put away that's your source. As long as you think like that, God can't bless you. You and I have got to get the source of prosperity right from the beginning. And the source from, of prosperity, like I said, is not what I have in my pocket or wallet or checking account, but it's what my heart holds close. And that's him. My source, your source, has got to be him. It's never numbers. We were talking about this today. For years, we'd go, for, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, we've been at this for 26 years now coming up. Just in this church, besides the churches before that. Preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I tell you something? There was never enough money. But do you know we're still here? Do you know we're still feeding a half a million people every single year, more than that now? Do you know we're sending buses out, picking up 25,000 people a year that don't have transportation? Can I just say this, that other churches don't want, because when you pick up people that don't have any transportation, they don't have any money. We want them. We spend $400 a month just on tires on buses just to get the people to church not including anything else. In other words, what I'm saying to you is we've never had any money, but we've had a great God who meets the needs each and every time. It's never about the number, it's about the great God. Are you following me? And until you get the source down, you will always be looking some other place for an answer. Look into your wallet, look at your checking account, looking for your boss looking for your job, looking for this. And there's always got to be, see, when we mess up right off the bat, our source. 
And when you mess up the source and you think, so our prayer life follows that. Oh God, give me a raise and I'll be fine. Can I just say something? Is God not the God of multiplication? Did he not take the uh, five loaves and two fish and feed like 15,000 people with them? Wait a minute. If that's the truth, he's a God of multiplication. So the source is not what you have. The source is what God does with it. Is that not true? And so all of a sudden we stop at what we have instead of who he is. When you stop at what you have instead of who he is, we've, we've made a mistake. And if we don't get the source down right off the bat of what our prosperity comes from, then what we'll do is we'll serve everything else except him. The job becomes more important than God. Because the job becomes our source of income that we pay our bills from and not God, see? And all of a sudden you're out of sync with God and you wonder why you're not getting blessed because you haven't even straightened out the very basics. And until we get the very basics down that the source of our future finances has gotta be God. Everything we have comes from him. Are, are you following me? Until we get that a little thing down, it doesn't work at all. We keep looking at numbers. We keep looking at situations. Let me tell you something. I, there's times, I bet there's been a hundred times that I have said to Debbie, we're not going to make it over these last 25, 30 years. Dr. Gilflin, is that not true? I mean, the guy lives in, on, on faith and fumes. Doesn't know how he's going to get around, but he hasn't missed a meal. Look at him. Just as cute as you can be, too. <laughs> you know, and so what happens is this, all of us are the same. We always miss the very first thing, the source. I want to take you, if I can, real quick to Scripture, if you can follow me on this. Here's Joseph. Remember the story of Joseph sold off into prison, into slavery in Egypt? And uh, he's not in a prison yet in Egypt. He's working for Potiphar, the Egyptian, great Egyptian, powerful Egyptian. In Genesis 39, verse number 2, Genesis 39, verse number 2 and 3, let me read it to you. Verse number 2 says, and the Lord, listen to this, not money, not gold, not silver, not his job. The source was the Lord was with Joseph. And he was a successful man. He wasn't successful because he was famous. He wasn't successful because he came from a certain family. He wasn't successful because he had an education. He wasn't successful because people knew who he was. He wasn't successful because he had, you know, a power or anything such as that. That's where we're at. We don't have anything but God, and you might as well know that. And you might as well recognize that. And if you want to be prosperous in the second, you're going to have to realize that when God's with you, you got you got this horse. And he says he'll be a successful man. And he was in the house of the master Egyptian. Here's Potiphar's house he's in. And man, he was the head of everything. He was just under Pharaoh himself. Verse 3 comes along. There's an interesting statement. And the master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. The source for prosperity is not you. It's God. And this is the most important thing. It's not your job. It's not even how much you make. Because you can have $10 and it can spend like $1. Anybody ever had that? Or you can have $10 that spends like $100 because God's in it. Is what they said. And he becomes his horse. So it isn't, doesn't matter if you're flipping hamburgers at McDonald's. God can take what you have and make it spend like something fabulous. And that's why we say, I can't do that job. Guess what? You're missing out on what this is all about. This is not about how much money you make on the job. It's about how big your God is in your heart. Somebody ought to say, and we miss the source. Real quick, let me just, I just want to just throw this verse out at you because it's such a good one. Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter. We miss the source because after we get blessed a little bit, we have a tendency to forget where we came from and forget. If we know where the source is, then we start to get blessed. What we do is we forget. I can't tell you how many people came to church, got their families together, started making money, started getting prosperous, and then stopped going to church. 
They go buy the second house. They go buy the motor home. They go buy this, buy that, buy this. And all of a sudden, their relationship with God stinks. Why? Because they forgot the source of where they came from. In Deuteronomy 6 chapter, let's just pop it up in verse number 10, says it like this. And so it shall be the Lord your God. Now, first of all, you got to understand something. This book, Deuteronomy, is not just any book. Moses is writing this. Now, listen to this. He's about 120 years old. A lot of people don't know this, that Deuteronomy, when it was written by Moses, was written to a people who were inevitably going to go in and take the promised land. The others have died off. And he's right before his death, he's writing this text of Deuteronomy. And as he writes this text of Deuteronomy, he's writing it to a people that are about ready to take the promised land. So he's telling them what to do, what not to. It's a fascinating book. And he makes a statement. He goes on and he says, And it shall be that when the Lord your God shall bring you into the land in which you swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a, a, a large and beautiful city in which you did not build. He talked about prosperity. That's prosperity. When you get a city you didn't build. Verse 12. Come on, pop it up for me. I'm sorry, uh, verse 11. <laughs> I'm sorry, you were way ahead of me and you were right and I was wrong. Please, Paul, I apologize. And I accept your apology too. And uh, houses <laughs> house full of good things in which you did not fill, uh, hewn out wells in which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees in which you did not plant. And when you have eaten and are full, verse 12, now verse 12, watch this. Then beware, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt and the house of bondage. In other words, can I tell you something? They forgot the source. The source, in order to get your life straightened out, in order for you to start living in prosperity, number one, you're going to have to understand the source. The source is him. His name is Jesus. Number two, I like this. Not only the source, because we're talking about things you need to know about prosperity. First one, source. Second one, listen to this, is, if you will, relationship. You have to understand, and so do I, about the relationship God has with us. The source is him, but the source is him. Now there's a relationship with him. It's a relationship of trust and a relationship of obedience. So once I get the place down where I know my source, then I need to understand what it's going to take for me, if you will, in relationship in order to continue him being my source. I have to trust him. I have to be obedient to him. There can never be a compromised relationship. If there's a compromised relationship, that means you're a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down. One week you're turned on to God, next week you don't give a flip about him. Has anybody ever, don't raise your hand, if you've ever been in a place where you've said, wow, I'm broke, I chase God. When I'm not broke, I don't chase God. When I got a few bucks, I'm now at the bar, you know, and I'm not chasing God. Let me tell you something, that relationship will keep you from prosperity. I love the word of God because it makes a great statement. Deuteronomy also, 29th chapter, verse number 9. Verse number 9 of the 29th chapter of Deuteronomy. You're already in Deuteronomy, so watch this. Therefore, keep the word of his covenant and do them that you may prosper in all that you do. Man, he's telling us about a relationship so much with God that I can trust him and listen to this, I can be obedient to, with him and I can do them. And when I do, according to the promise, if I do them, then he will prosper me and all that I do. There's this wonderful verse I found in 2 Chronicles 26. Spirit of God revealed this to me. 2 Chronicles 26 chapter, verse number five. Watch this. He sought God in the days of Zechariah who had understanding in the vision of God and as long as he sought the Lord, as long as he sought the Lord, relationship. Watch this. Some people have a lousy relationship. Some people have a weekend relationship. Some people have a Sunday. As long as he sought the Lord, some people have a relationship based on what somebody else is doing. As long as he sought the Lord, watch this, God made him, what was that word? Prosper. 
as long as he was there in a relationship with God that meant something, was not compromised. And all of a sudden, so we find out some things we need to know. Number one, we need to know the source. It's got to be God. Number two, there's got to be a, a, if you will, an important relationship with God that's based on trust and obedience. I got to do that. But I like this one. You got to also know this, and this is important for all of us because there are things we need to know about prosperity. The third one would be this, responsibility. Responsibility means there's something that I'm going to have to do in order for this to happen. Why? Because God puts out a principle. What you sow, you'll reap. Now, can I just say this? He doesn't say sow and you will reap. He said what you sow. You remember the verse? Remember, he didn't say sow and you will reap. Because that'd be great. But he says what you sow, you will reap. In other words, what you sow is very important for you, what it is you're going to get back. If I sow junk, what I sow, I'm getting what back? Junk. If I sow God's ways, I'm getting. So there's got to be a responsibility for me to do something. I love the word of God that comes along, gives us insight in 1 Chronicles. We're in the Old Testament all, all night tonight. 1 Chronicles 22 verse 13 says this. It says, then you will prosper. Listen to this. David is, is, is writing this to Solomon. Then you will prosper if you take care to fulfill the statutes and the judgments in which the Lord charged Moses concerning Israel. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be dismayed. I mean, sometimes we forget about the responsibility we have to act a certain way. Why? Because back to number two, we have a, if you will, a, a very important thing, a relationship based on trust and obedience, which takes us back to number one because he is the source. Now with that in mind, let me give you some more information, one more. Can you handle one more tonight about prosperity? Because what we're doing is we're not only looking at God, but we're looking at ourselves. Why is it? that God hasn't prospered you? Could it be that that source really hasn't been God? It's been a job or money or whatever. Has it really been, a, a, if you will, a relationship hasn't been based on trust and obedience? It really hasn't been a responsibility. I haven't really got in and did and done what I know to do. I kind of waver in those areas because what I sow, I reap, and I'm really not sowing what I should be sowing, so therefore I'm reaping what I shouldn't be reaping. And that which I don't want, which brings me to number four, which I love this one, and this is, I love this, is connection. You got to understand there's a certain kind of connection in order to receive the prosperity that you and I have and desire. We're going to have to have a connection with God that makes a statement to the world around you. Let me give you an illustration of that from Jesus' own words, if I may. John, the 15th chapter, red letter in your Bible, Jesus is speaking. He says these words. He says, I am the true vine. I love those words, true vine. In other words, some are vines, but they're not true vines. If you're going to grow and produce the right product, you've got to be connected to the right vine. If you're connected to the wrong vine, you're going to produce the wrong product. And Jesus comes along and he makes this statement, I am the true vine. And then he makes this statement, you're the branch. And he says, you can't do anything without him. In other words, you've got to be connected to him. And he says, live, stay, and dwell. He uses the one word in the, in, the, in the Bible. He says, abide in me and I will abide in you. The word abide means there in the original text, live, stay, and dwell. In other words, if there's a connection, the connection is I live in Jesus, I stay in Jesus, and I live out life, I dwell in Jesus. And as I live out life and I live, stay, and dwell in Jesus, I am now connected to the true vine, not the false vine. 
And in that true vine, I can now produce because he says these words, without that connection, you can't produce anything. And so if I'm going to produce something, if I'm going to get to a place in my life where I'm prosperous in every area of my life, in every area of my life, in every area of my life, you got to hear this one more time, in every area of my life, if I'm going to prosper in every area of my life, can I just say this to you? I've got to be connected to the true vine and how am I connected? I have to live, stay, and dwell. And as I live, stay, and dwell, I draw my life from the true vine. I don't draw. See, a lot of times we're connected to other stuff. We're connected to our jobs. We're connected to money. We're connected to our relatives. We're connected to the society. We're connected to the politicians. We're connected to the economics. We're connected to all kinds of stuff that make up life. And here God says, you're going to have to be connected to him. Because in the connection with him, you produce the right product. And without him, you produce nothing, he goes on to say. And then he, may I say this, he caps it all off, and he makes this statement. He says, and when you're connected with me, you can ask anything you want, and I'll answer your prayers. In fact, he says that two times in chapter number 15. And once in chapter number 60, come on, someone says, I want to have my prayers answered. You got to be connected to him to get it. And it's all about four simple things tonight that we're learning. This is a journey. God wants to, number one, prosper you. Can you imagine that? Now, I don't know what that means to you. For some, it means owning a home. Some it means having a really neat car. Some means just living life in the fullness with your family, seeing your family raised and being blessed beyond your comprehension. Some it might mean, you know, starting a large corporation and God backing and blessing it. Each one of us, the word, if you will, prosperity is amazingly subjective. What it is to one person is different to others. So for us to throw it out and say, this is what God wants to do to you, other than the word he wants to prosper you. Now, let your heart determine what's prosperous. But it only is determined as you go to the right source. Because you have, number two, the right relationship. And number three, you're willing to do the right responsibilities because you're connected to the right vine. And all of that is what gets you to get in the flow of the prosperity of God. Part two, next time I'm with you on a Wednesday night, you're going to love it. Somebody give the Lord a great big praise. You know that? <laughs> Man, I love it. I love the Word of God. And I love the fact, when I heard that God wanted to prosper me, I thought, man, that, that is really love. I never heard that before. I was a Christian before someone told me that it just excited me. Not that I wanted money. I just wanted somebody who cared enough about me that wanted me to prosper. Why would my mom and dad want me to prosper? You want your kids to prosper. Don't tell me you don't. You'd do anything you can to see them prosper. Why would our Heavenly Father be any different? He wants to prosper you. If God spoke to you tonight about something, give the Lord. A great big praise. I'm going to ask you to check yourself out. The Bible says that you should examine yourself from time to time. Make sure you're right with God. So I'm going to ask you a question. You answer the question in your heart. Nobody will know but you and God. Is that okay? Nobody will know but you and God. People with you won't know. People behind you won't know. Nobody will know but you and God. Answer the question, though, and don't just stare at me. If you were to walk out of this building, your heart stopped and you died, bang! Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Just answer that question. If you died in the next few minutes, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Now, let's examine your answer because your answer says a lot about where you're at. Some of you said, well, I think I'm going to go to heaven. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to think your way into heaven? Whoever's the most positive thinker is going to make it. You're not going to make it. And somebody needs to tell you. You can't think your way into heaven. Some of you said, well, I hope, Pastor Jim, I hope I'm going to get to heaven. Can I tell you something? That's the wrong answer. Nowhere does it say whoever's the greatest hoper, I don't even know if that's a word, gets to go to heaven. 
you're not going to make it and somebody needs to tell you. Some of you might say to yourself, well, wait a minute, Pastor Jim. I love God a whole lot. I'm going to go to heaven because I love God. Guess what? Nowhere in the Bible does it say because you love God you get to go to heaven. I would think it'd say that, but it doesn't. That's not how you get to heaven. Some of you said to yourself, wait a minute, I'm going to go to heaven because I'm really a good person. That's what most people in America think that's going to get them to heaven because they're good. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say because you're good you get to go to heaven? Nowhere. It's not in the Bible. You're not going to make it. Somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, honor you enough, tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Now listen closely. Jesus made this statement. Listen to the statement. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. That's what Jesus said. In other words, you can't get to heaven your way or my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. I, I wish you could, but you can't. There's only one way to heaven. And Jesus tells us exactly that way in the scripture, John 3rd chapter. He said these words, you must be born again. Now, wait a minute. When we hear the word born again, immediately most Americans turn off because Hollywood's done a really good job in screwing up what God says and making everybody that's born again look like an idiot, radical, fanatical, and a screwball loser. But that's not what God's talking about. Born again means something from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. Most people don't even know what it means, but I'll tell you what it means. Here's what it means. It means you have given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Always has been, always will be, all or nothing. I'll prove it to you, okay? I'll watch this, listen to this. I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, Jesus himself is speaking. It's a book of Revelation. You've heard of it. And he says, I'm coming again, and you know he is. And listen to the words that he says. He says, I'm coming again, and when I come, I better find you hot, or I better find you cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Wow, what a rude, crude statement Jesus just made. Can you imagine that? Rude and crude. I'll vomit you from my mouth. You know what he just really said? People who call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all, and they're not going to make it. Oh, oh my goodness. That's what he just got through saying. What's lukewarm? Let's define it so we're all on the same page. Lukewarm, little in, little out. Little up, little down, token prayer, occasional church attendance. You're not against God. Oh, no, you're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. He's just something. He's along with all the other things that are important in your life. He's one of those important things too but he's not everything. He'll never be something in your life until you make him everything. How? By giving him all of your heart, giving him all of your life, being born again. Here we are. We've laughed. We've sung. We, some of you got healed right before your eyes. There's miracles take place right before your eyes. I don't know what else you could possibly. You heard the word of God. You were great listening to the word of God tonight, but guess what? You haven't yet given God all of your heart. You haven't yet given God all of your life, and someone needs to tell you that if you walk out of this place tonight and you're not right with God and you die, you're going to go to hell, and it's your responsibility. But tonight in this safe place, you can give God all of your heart, give God all of your life. Be born again, watch this, be headed for heaven and denying your presence in hell. Wow, that'd be pretty cool. You say, well, Pastor Jim, how do I do that? How do I give God all my heart, give God all my life? Let's do it God's way. Let's don't do it my way, your way. Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. So all across this auditorium, it is your call, your choice. See, I can't make it for you. The people next to you can't make it. People behind you can't do it for you. This is about you, your heart, a free will choice that God gives you to give him all of your heart, give him all of your life. I'm going to count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up. You can put it right back down afterwards. Simple as that. 
But listen to this. I'll go one, two, three, bang. All of you that need to get right with God by giving God all of your heart, giving God. Listen, I already know you know who Jesus is. I already know you celebrate Christmas every year of your life. I already know that you celebrate Easter, but that doesn't make you a Christian. You say, wait a minute, I know who Jesus is. Of course, the devil knows who Jesus is. Doesn't make him a Christian either. So it's not what you've done with your head, it's what you've done with your heart. And here you are in this safe, friendly place, and tonight, <laughs> it's your night of salvation. I'm gonna count to three, pop my hands together all across this auditorium. You get your hand up and let me see it. You say, wait a minute, pastor, hold on. If you want me to raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. I'm gonna, I'm gonna feel funny. Yep, you are. Get over it. It's better to feel funny in a safe place like this for a moment than to be in hell forever and ever and ever because you care more about what people think instead of what God sees. Come on, no one's that dumb, but the devil thinks you're dumb and he's trying to talk you out of it right now. Tonight is your night of salvation. I'm counting to three. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God? Instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are not sure, make sure tonight is your night of salvation. Are you ready? Are you ready? Here it is. One. Even back in the family rooms, get ready to pop your hand up. I can see you back there, and that's full back there. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two. Thank you. There's one other one back over here. Three, four. Thank you. God bless you. There's five right over here. God bless you. Anybody else? There's six. There's seven. Thank you. Anybody else? Real quick. There's seven wise people already. Come on. Don't miss this. There's seven wise people. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? I see that. Thank you. God bless you. There's another one, thank you. Anybody else? There's another one, thank you. Anybody else, real quick, anybody else, anybody else? There's seven or eight wise people, anybody else? Anybody else, don't miss this, anybody? Come on, if you're sitting to yourself saying, I wonder if I should do this, you should. Anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a great big praise for seven or eight wise people. Here's what I want you to do. All seven or eight of you, I want you to be bold, and I want you to do this. Once you get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible friend, get your stuff. Bring a friend if you need to get a friend. Say to your neighbor right now, say, if you need to go, I'll go with you. But I want every one of you that raised your hand and anybody that should have raised your hand, you can come too. Get out of your seat. Get in the aisle. Meet me right here in front. Come on, you come right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Just as I am without Come on, come on, come on, come on. as many as I said. I don't know where you all came from, but I'm glad you came. Over here, look at this guy waving at you. Over to your left. You see this guy at your left? His name is Pastor Joel. Good guy. No weird stuff goes on. He's going to pray with you, give you some free stuff, and he's going to, listen to this, tell you about a program we have that'll help you get strong in Jesus. Let us help you get strong in Jesus. Why? So you don't go back, falling through the cracks, serving the devil, but you go on serving God. That's what this is all about tonight. Let us help you to do that. Is that okay? Make a left turn real quick. Follow Joel right over this way. Right over there. Come on, let's give him a great big praise. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son 
and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.